Serial experiments Lane has since its release 25 years ago left viewers intrigued yet confused. An amalgamation of philosophical themes in an iceberg style series that quickly turns from psychological horror to existential thinking and a full blown prophecy of the challenges we would face with the rise of the internet. This show was made in the 90s, but the way it portrays the World Wide Web, you would think it came out not even five years ago. It's no cakewalk to analyze and explain Lane, even given its short length of 13 episodes. For the past several years, I, along with countless of people online, have theorized how exactly Lane's story played out. But today, all of that information will be laid out for you to take in. This will be the single most intricate video explaining Serial Experiments Lane. And for us to understand everything Serial Experiments has to offer, we must first understand how Lane's conception for existence came to be. And to do that, we need to start with him. The man known as Eddie was a chief researcher at Tachibana Labs until one decision led to his firing. Eddie was a bit of an egocentric, thinking of himself as superior to others worthy of more. He also believed that the internet here called the Wired was a superior plane of existence. He believed through connecting all human life to the Wired without the use of mediums like computers or phones was the next step of mankind's evolution. And who better to lead it than him? So Eddie inputted a protocol into the seventh generation chips, Protocol 7, which would carry out his will to connect all at an unconscious level to unite humanity in the Wired. But through that, something was born. Birth may not be the right word, Lane had always existed, at least has since the creation of the Wired. The only difference is, Lane wasn't Lane at this time, she was just an omnipresent force residing in the internet, a being that did not act, but watch. Just as we have the World Wide Web or cloud save data now, Lane existed in unseen worlds of information, but that's not all. She was not a person, not a thing, just an entity of existence, until Eddie changed that. Once fired, he dumped his body at a train crossing, killing himself, and fully becoming one with the Wired. How this process occurred is not explored. It could be he uploaded his consciousness. It could be the protocol he put into place would allow for this to occur. Its goal was to destroy the barrier between Wired and reality. It could be he was able to exist solely in the Wired, based on these failing separations he began. Immediately following his body's death, Eddie constructed a being known as Lane, a homunculus of ribosomes synthetically created to not be too dissimilar to a normal human. In it, the being, the soul he encountered within the Wired was bestowed, bringing life to an otherwise empty corpse. He knew his creation would hold immense power stemming from the Wired, and if nurtured correctly, he could harness it through her. He could use this being to carry out his will of destroying the barrier between the Wired and reality. Without Lane, the embodiment of Eddie's protocol seven, he could not hope to accomplish this, but never would he outright admit that, for Eddie had gained quite the following. It seemed that within the Wired, he was revered as God, omnipresent, all watching. But you and I both know who really holds that role. After bringing the omnipresent being of the Wired to the real world, Eddie constructed a false life around her. A fake family, fake friends, fake identity. Nothing was natural about her existence or what surrounded her. This game of house was put into place so when the time comes and Lane has weakened the barrier between the two worlds, Eddie could come to her as her savior of some sorts, her god, and guide her through the final steps. This plan was nothing but elaborate. Using his power as a godlike stand-in, he altered the memories of Lane's schoolmates, convinced them that she was always there. Her family was handpicked by Eddie, and for reasons unexplored, they seem in debt to him, showing no desire to carry out their mission of guiding Lane into the Wired, yet they still comply. Eddie, through a third party, hires two men in black to deliver Lane to her home for the first time. These two are tasked to watch over her as well, to see that she falls to no harm and is properly guided. They believe they work for a client of Tachibana, who leads them to believe they are taking steps to prevent this blend of two worlds. They are none the wiser of who the man in grey answers to, one of a handful of parties that follow Eri, another the Knights, a strange and ominous force that no one is truly sure exists. There are numerous people who wish to join to be a member, but no one really knows who runs the show that is the Knights. Eddie either seized control or used the concept of the Knights to collect believers both in his cause and in his godhood. The Knights want the same thing Eddie wants, what God wants. They believe that the Wired is the upper layer of existence, superior, and want to bring it forth to the real world. So it's important to set them up as a party who believes they are acting on the will of God. Whatever God says, they will carry out, no matter the implications. There's one final thing I want to make clear before dissecting each episode in hopes of peeling back the curtains and revealing to you all this show has to offer and that is Lane. We've talked about her some, but not near enough to understand what she will soon go through. The girl who came from the Wired suffers from heavy dissociative identity. Part of this is caused by hallucinations that the Knights strike her with as part of their orders. She also exists as various entities both in her real body and within the Wired. Despite how Eddie may act, he is not perfect. Her entire soul was not severed from the Wired, but it could be
be that this was also intentional. We know Eddie sets up these events that occur to Lane to lure her to the wire, strike her curiosity, and make her find comfort in the wire, not the real world. Everything points to the wire so that Lane's existence can break the barrier. She herself defies the current law of nature. Only she can merge the two worlds. Lane, however, doesn't set out for this purpose. She sets out to understand the wired, then to understand herself. It isn't until late that she understands the purpose of her creation, and depending on which lane you ask, how she feels about this purpose will vary. Very many lanes exist, all the same lane, yet a tad different, personality-wise. Some existing within her body, some only residing in the wired. The one lane soul sides with at the end will determine what the future holds for humanity. Lane is not just the one who calls herself Lane, there is more to her story. The first words we hear are spoken by a girl, soon to be dead. We don't know who she speaks to on this roof, the only two options seem logical, Eddie or Lane of the Wired. Chisa believes she does not need a body, that it is a vessel that gets in the way, so she rids herself of it. The Bean's words echo through the electric pulse, along with the noise of others. Layer 1 is given the title Weird, something you'll get used to as you sink deeper into this iceberg. Serial Experiments sets itself up to be picked apart, prior to the show's structure, its titles, and leading dialogues as vital to the analytical starting line. The term weird can be taken at face value here. Lane is a strange show, its first episode makes that clear out of the gate. But weird doesn't always mean strange or odd. Weird can mean fate, it can mean unknowable. From start to finish, all these definitions of weird are correct for the show. Serial Experiments is weird, but it also prescribes in the feeling that all of this was fated to happen, that it must, yet at the same time the concepts at play are scarily weird, unexplainable. Lane's world always holds an off-putting feel. The shadows of the world are harsh, deep black, with spots of scarlet red as if there was blood, but it's quickly made clear that Lane's shadow is different. We see that hers holds a misty, fog-like presence to it. Note that this isn't always the case. To me, this first day Lane exits her home is the first day within this life. Her actions to me indicate this to be so. The annoyance she verbally communicates on the train at the noise of people, her dyslexic-like ability to not read the board, her lack of any social skills, all of it. It's as if she is yet to adapt to this life. That being said though, there isn't much time to sit on this theory. But make sure to pay attention to how dramatic a shift her verbal yell to a crowd on the train is to her timid persona she holds at school. This is our first first clue that Lane has multiple personalities. Lane is soon made aware of Chisa's suicide and the emails she's been sending to students throughout the week, despite being dead though during that time. Alice, the one girl in the school who will reach out to Lane, is the girl who sparks Lane's curiosity into this matter. Before, Lane doesn't know nearly anything about computers, doesn't even check her emails, but because of Alice, Lane's path to Wonderland is opened. As class moves on, Lane's dyslexia-like traits kick in, followed by fog irradiating from her hands. It's odd to say the least, fitting to be called weird, but why the hell does this even happen? And what is it supposed to mean? I take it this strange occurrence is a cue to us as viewers to suspend disbelief. Understand that we are seeing the events of this world through the lens of a child, and a mentally unsound internet being with an artificial body to be more specific. Lane suffers from delusions, hallucinations, and memory confabulation. She herself doesn't understand what's happening to her. How could we hope, as viewers, viewers of her point of view to understand them with no further information. We can assume from our knowledge of the entirety of the show that either Lane was being delusional here or the knights were causing her to have a hallucination, something they will do often, but never pinpointed on what is or isn't caused by them. Lane checks her messages on her PC. Alice was onto something. She really did receive a message from a dead girl. The dead miraculously begins a full conversation. Lane doesn't understand what is happening, but Chisa makes it clear that she, along with everyone, will soon know. Uncommunicative. Weird. Two words that describe this family perfectly. Probably the easiest twist to figure out is that this family is fake. The four act as if total strangers, the mother are not even the least bit interested when her daughter has been communicating with a dead girl. Lane's father is a heavy computer nerd. It seems his role is to support Lane's dive into the navvy computers. More for us, Lane's father sets the basic principles of the internet. 
its original goal and function. We can think of Lane's father as the original good intention goal of the Wired. Well, Eddie is a perfect example of how chaotic the digital landscape can become. Lane comes to her father for a new Navi system, as hers is quite dated. Her wish is granted, after all, that's her father's purpose here, to guide her into the Wired. As a reminder on what layer this is, something weird happens once more. Lane's train strikes a girl, but the only one privy to this information is the girl who is connected to all beings via the wire. For unexplained reasons, either from hallucination or mental connection, Lane is shown the accident caked in the same fog that surrounded her in the classroom. The girl before her showcases a wide variety of expressions no normal human would make, switching between a psychopathic grin and a yell of true terror. Lane tries to stop this incident from happening, calling out to the girl who runs towards the oncoming train, but her voice falls deaf, unheard over the steam whistle. Lane comes to, not aboard the train anymore, but in the classroom, to find the logic the world abides to, almost as if she was plucked out of time and put back at a different moment. She tries to collect herself, but looking at the chalkboard, the characters change form, reordering, transforming from code to something legible. Come to the Wired as soon as you can. Lane walks home, Chisa spawning in and out of Lane's reality, causing Lane distress. Finally, she acknowledges her presence, asking where it is she exists if not here. How, without a body, could you stand before me? Her answer, only a smile as she begins glowing, humming like the electric poles around her. She disappears. Only the hum remains. <laughs> The theme of Layer 2 is girls, a very broad concept that has multiple interpretations on the goal of leaving us with just that simple word. It shouldn't be ignored that girls is intentionally plural here, and not singular, meaning whatever serial experiments wants us to take away from this layer, it is a group of girls that should be our main focus, and there are two groups that fit this mark. Siberia, a club that screams adult, yet for a majority of the series, children frequent this drug and alcohol infested landscape. Siberia is a club that appeals both to the mature and the young, and to our first group that is girls. Lane, as we tell, struggles with her identity in many ways. Girl is one of them. Lane is a girl, yet as a girl, she holds none of those traits that are stereotypical of one. She's not sociable, concerned with her appearance, nor, for lack of a better word, girly. Lane is purely Lane. We know she is a girl, but there's nothing about her that screams the gender stereotype type, and this is entirely done on purpose to showcase her unique nature in comparison to girls like Alice and her clique. The trio invite Lane to come to Siberia with them after mistakenly accusing her of being at the club the night before, where they saw someone with the same hairstyle arguing with another. Enter the second group, that is, girls. Lane herself is a girl, but really she is many girls, many personalities, and we have just been made aware of a second. Apparent in every rendition of Lane, including the PlayStation game and manga, each Lane is different. She is still Lane in the psyche tense, but personality how she carries herself changes. For clarity's sake, though, we will only talk about the anime lanes. Within the Wired, many lanes exist, each a different part of her. They're all lane, it's not as if this is a matter of Dopplers. It's just that Lane has compartmentalized herself, and due to the odd nature of her existence, these various pieces of her can act on their own will, without Lane's realization. This isn't all too uncommon with people suffering from dissociative identity. There tends to be a personality that is innocent, timid, and childish, the Lane that we are first introduced to. But there is also a side of them that must burden the weight of their trauma, whatever that may be. Those memories aren't just thrown away. That is the lane the other three girls encounter. The lane that takes charge, that gets shit done. Innocent Lane knows nothing of this other one. Besides these two main personas, Lane has others, all stemming from these two, but for now, let's just focus on this pair, the original girls. Lane meets the girls at the club, dressed suitable for her age, but completely polar to Alice and company's outfits. This sets up deferring levels of maturity, not just for the girls in front of us, but also the girls that reside within Lane. In front of us is the timid, shy, young Lane, but the other is different. JJ, the DJ at Siberia, along with the click comment on how different this Lane is dressed up, compared to the other, who looked and acted older and more mature. As the group converses, though, a man, high off an electronic drug, goes mad, shooting two in his manic state. The club becomes hysterical, 
people running for the doors, but Lane locks eyes with the shooter. When he sees her face, his mania peaks once more. He hits her with a flurry of questions. All these phrases reveal much to us as an audience. One, Lane is somehow involved in his manic episode. It could be that there is a her that exists solely in the Wired outside of her current realm of consciousness. Two, there's a confirmed god in the Wired that has some stake in Lane. Three, the goal of the god in Lane is to blend the Wired in the real world. Four, this man does not know Lane, yet he knows her. This is a confirmation that point one is completely true. We have another Lane on our hands. Lane's personality flicks, her demeanor changes. This words rock the man's spirit. It does something to him. He turns the gun away from Lane and... Psyche, our entry point into layer 3. There are several interpretations of what Psyche is. One I favor is it's our humanity, but there is another, more Freudian-like theory that this show has made clear it wants to follow. The Psyche is compromised of pieces. Beneath the surface of consciousness exists the ID, the ego, and the superego. We'll go into detail on more of these sections of Psyche later, but for now, just listen to this quote from Lane's father. <laughs> We won't pick apart any further for now. It's as if he's telling us we just aren't ready. The police call Lane's home, but receive no answer. Not surprising given her family situation, but there is more to this strangeness when Lane enters her parents' room to, I suppose, check on them. No one is there. They've seemingly disappeared. She moves to her own room. Lane wishes her Navi goodnight. It reciprocates the farewell. This is somewhat shocking. It's as if the computer may have a psyche itself, its own ability to think like AI. Could it possibly be that it's self-aware? In the past, Lane had seen a man in black watching her, standing directly behind an electric pole on her way to school. But today, the man has been replaced by a black sedan, tinted windows, sheltering any hints of humans within the vehicle, until a red laser flicks on from inside, following her movements. She begins to run for the train. Hey. The girls talk of the man who shot himself around the shoe lockers, obviously not very torn up by the incident, despite in the moment showing signs of experiencing severe trauma. It's not a stretch to believe that they are all experiencing dissociative disorder, as their ego deflects the moral weight of seeing people killed to protect their original self. To elaborate on their earlier Freudian theory, that's the ego's job, to protect the deeper layers of the psyche, of the unconscious, even if that means sacrificing the judgment of right and wrong that makes up the superego, the other half of the iceberg that it's in a constant tug of war with. House points this out to the other two, how it's strange they can't take this suicide and double murder seriously. The other girls just laugh the whole situation off. No one here is ready to deal with the darkness of mankind they witnessed. That is, except Lane. She takes the events at face value. It helps her realize the cold and harsh human nature that can exist in reality. It could be that God set this event up to push Lane deeper into the wire. Either way, her march continues. She has come at least subconsciously aware that two personalities exist within her, proven by her scribbles in the notebook as the void repeats. Who is Lane? In Lane's locker, a processor is left in a browned envelope. Said to be mass produced in factories in Taiwan, designed by the group The Knights. Like urban legend, their existence is debated, but whether or not they are an ideal or a group of individuals is unimportant. There are people out there that believe they are servers of the Knights, making them as real as they need to be. Lane leaves for Siberia, running by the sedan, projecting red lasers through the windshield. She approaches this boy she ran into the night of the murders, who gives her installation instructions of the processor, but also makes clear that he's met her before within the Wired, except she was completely different. While it's true that most people on the internet will take on a different personality than what they have in the real world, Lane's is the complete opposite, almost like she's a different person. He desires to meet what he calls the wild lane. Mika returns home to find two MIVs standing at the front door. When she attempts to speak to them, they make clear they were never here, telling her she never saw them. Mika walks by Lane's room to see her tampering with her computer, adding the psyche processor. We cut to Mika's eyes as she stares at her sister, but things start getting strangely fuzzy. It's as if her memory is being overridden in real time. This lane welcomes her home. It's possible the knights are already at work in the minds of others. The separation between wired and reality slowly waning, and Mika is reaching the end of her part in this story. 
たった一人なんだよ誰ともつながってなんかない A concept you feel either two ways about. You might dislike religion, how it separates us humans into groups who go on to fight each other on who is the righteous, who holds the proper beliefs. Or you might like it, the comfort and hope it brings, the community behind it. But this isn't the point of religion in Layer 4. It's not about politics and beliefs we hold today, it's something more individual. Religion can also mean one's private spiritual life. Lane has developed an obsession for the wired, and in some ways, this has benefited her. In others, not so much. The family dynamic, while barely there to start with, has completely collapsed, all members showcasing this feeling of isolation. Lane's father watches her from her navvy, but the two never connect in any way. They aren't even shown in the frame at the same time. Mika sneaks alcohol from the fridge, her parents pay no mind. For the family, Lane's push into the wired has inversely affected them. It may very well be, they know what will come of it. For Lane, the wired has offered her a transcendent experience. She is more happy, more joyful, her friends and family taking note of these changes. It seems the The Wired for Lane has offered her a new opportunity and life purpose. The Wired has become more to her than a simple communication network. Now, there is another side of religion, the communal aspect, which is told through the Knights. The cult like group pushes their agenda that the Wired is a higher existence than life and reality through desperate means. Knowing the barriers thin between the two worlds, they merge a dungeon crawler game with a children's tag game. The player's actions bleed over into the real world, the player's unable to. Log off. There have been a string of suicides of players running from ghouls who just turn out to be the little children playing tag, but there is one game that ends in an alternative winner. The child dies instead. In their quest to bring attention to the crippling wall between wired and reality, the knights will sacrifice lives for their heaven, their god. It is through his will that they commit atrocities. For believers, that can be enough to commit even murder. Lane watches over the boy as he suffers distress at his actions, attempting to rationalize his innocence. She's disgusted by the knights. Believers. They may view the wire the same way, the religion intertwined in some ways, but this, this isn't part of her belief. It's worth noting that at this point, Lane's psyche processor is fully operational, and Lane herself is very skilled at its use. She's able to insert her full being, her full consciousness, into the wire, able to walk around as if still within reality, but she also has the unique ability to attach herself to individuals, able to cross from reality to the wired to an individual who is connected to the wire. She can, in some ways, connect with other humans. Humans observe and watch over them, communicate with them directly. We've heard it said before. But as we saw with the boy who killed the child, when he saw Lane and asked for help, she simply told him. Lane still has her own limitations, yet day by day her abilities become more supernatural and less technological. One day there may be nowhere she can't go. Lane's father approaches her with a word of discretion. コミュニケーションするための空間。He's bathed in the harsh blacks of the room, projecting this feeling that he is the one mistaken, while our protagonist enjoys the bright light shining upon her as she smiles. Lane assures her father not to worry. She is still Lane, but he questions that. Sometimes he wonders if the girl in front of him is the same one that was brought to them not too long ago. No longer the timid girl who couldn't even check her email. Lane surfs the wired. She has begun to research the knights, angered by their actions, the way they depict her beloved wired, her religion. The knights, on the other hand, are having their god, their protector and provider, questioned by a girl with omnipresence within their holy land, and they fear her. A laser scans her room. Running to her window, Lane sees. That the men in black have returned. Her face is filled with anger. She's tired of the knights tampering with her. She commands them to leave, this order transcending through both wired and reality, projecting out the window towards the man with the ponytail. The headset he wears explodes on his face. Her navy buckles at the workload of this command. She and her machine have become one. It seems that the wired and people are more connected than some may believe. Lane was right. It is more than just a simple information transfer system. <laughs> それはあなたに語りかけているもしそれが見えるならそれはあなたの
five. Distortion is at the roots of layer five, opening with a brief summary of evolution that quickly distorts to an opinionated view of it, a view that humans have evolved into an absurd neoteny creature who no longer evolves, clinging to the flesh as a means of satisfying one's material desires, worthless and no longer necessary. The narrator talks of an exit, an alternative to what they would describe as a pointless existence inside the body, the exit being the wired that they believe is the next step of evolution. This voice, this being has been speaking to Lane. We recognize it. It claims to be God, but from my eyes and most likely yours, this God is nothing but a fraud whose identity we'll come to know more of later. The creator of Layton's body, Eddie. Maki walks home from a hookup crossing the famous Shibuya crosswalk when the first distortion in her reality occurs. A car deviates from his purpose in society of transportation, transforming into a battering ram, colliding with bodies. The traffic lights that hang overhead have also become distorted, deviating from its purpose of guidance. The nights are bringing chaos into reality. And then the episode, the layer as a whole, becomes distorted. We deviate from the usual linear narrative into a realm not following space-time. Intermixed with the overarching scenario at hand is Lane, communicating with various entities. First a doll, then a tiki mask, then a puppet like her mother, and finally a puppet like her father, all conversing through the same conversation topic. Prophecy, the distortion of time, the belief that prophecy is a window into the future of what will come. An idea like this denies the belief we hold on to that time is linear. But what if time wasn't? What if everything happened all at once? Our peek into the future, our prophecy, still a distortion to our minds, but really just the act of pulling back the veil that separates what is now and what will be, showing us the next layer of the onion. The doll tells Lane that Lane is all-knowing. She is, after all, a being that exists throughout the wired, omnipresent and all. Lane's desire is to learn of something she doesn't, which sparks the conversation conversation of prophecy. Since Lane abides by present information, the only thing she wouldn't know is what hasn't come to happen yet. If she was to know, though, she would in some ways be peeking into the mind of God, the being that is presumed to be all-knowing of all time. Lane distorts our story, appearing at the crossing despite us being present in her room talking to dolls. Mika spots her and becomes curious. She is then bumped though and handed a wipe. Opening it reveals in red writing, the other side is overcrowded, the dead will have no place to go. She looks over to see Lane, now in the street, cars passing her by, muttering. One of the Shibuya screens becomes distorted, projecting an image of Lane. Lane and the Mass debate on what is prophecy. Lane stating that if fulfilled, then something cannot be prophecy. It isn't telling of a future event. History is not merely a linear connection of points that we pass through on a timeline. They are connected by a line. Perhaps it is more accurate to say that they are made to connect. The Tiki Mask explains to us that history is not pre-written. Just as not every prophecy comes true, not every point of time is connected. There are many paths we could walk down in life, various forks in the road, each a possibility, a what could happen scenario. The Mask believes that prophecy Prophecy is an outlook into a possibility of the future, not an outlook into the guaranteed. But Lane wonders then, who chooses which points, which possibilities connect to make a timeline? She receives no answer from the mask. The obvious one that comes to mind is God, fate, or whatever you desire to call it. Lane has returned to her timid personality. Gone is the happy-go-lucky Lane of religion. We have somehow regressed. Lane also has no memory of being in Shibuya, of casting her image upon the screen. It could very well be the Lane of the Wired, the piece of her that has always existed on the web at work. Lane's mother stands before her like a puppet, sharing an idea that is from the god that is likely behind these talks with Lane. It's reasonable to see the wired as an upper layer of the real world. Like physical reality is nothing but a hologram of the information that flows through the wired. This is because the body, the activity of the human brain, is merely a physical phenomenon caused by synapses delivering electrical impulses. The body only exists to verify one's own existence. Lane asks the puppet if she is truly her mom. She receives no answer. Her words have been seated in Lane. The idea that the wired is a higher plane of existence, that the body is a simple vessel. The wired is where humanity should transfer to, where it belongs, replace wired with heaven, and the quote is very synonymous with how some treat life on earth. At the dinner table, Mika asks Lane if she was in Shibuya. Lane acts confused by her question, so she drops it. <laughs> Mika then finds herself back at the cross section of Shibuya, dazed and confused. Just a moment prior, she was eating dinner with her family. It seems her entire reality is becoming drastically distorted beyond repair. She looks around her, the people walking past turning to blobs of mush, their human-like features fading. She becomes afraid. Looking into the sky, we see that underneath her, the insignia of the knights is ingrained. They have somehow taken Mika 
her spirit, her soul, hostage. Mika runs into a restaurant, further sinking into psychosis. Sitting down, her coffee spills before her, the liquid taking shape of words. Fulfill the prophecy. She looks up. The once full restaurant is soulless and empty. Wherever she is, whatever may be inflicting her, she is alone. Mika is somewhat aware that her reality is twisting, that she cannot calm her mind and come to terms with what's happening around her. The lights of the bathroom she has found herself in flicker off. Behind her, a door creaks open. She approaches the source of the noise, reaching towards the door. The light flickers on, the door shutting behind her. Coating the wall in red, repeating across the door, she is once more subjected to the words, fulfill the prophecy. Instead of answering, the father puppet throws out a rhetorical question. It's possible that what flows through the wired isn't merely electrical information. If it's assumed the development of electricity and phones brought about the information of the wired, then you have to wonder if another world was created at that moment. Well, here in the real world, God exists only as a concept, something that cannot be seen at our stage of existence. It could be that in the wired, there may be a sort of deus-like embodiment. I'm not sure whether or not it should be called a god, but at the very least, it has some kind of power that is written about in only myth. Lane tells the puppet of her father that she believes she's talking to this so-called god, unaware of the fact that the mystic being within the wire deserving of that title is herself, and the father before her is merely a puppet for the false god, made to convince her that he is the true omnipotent being within the wired. Lane is his disciple. The puppet states that this deus of the wired may be able to already affect the real world in the form of prophecy. Words carry powers. Merely whispering in someone's ear that something will happen can bring the event to reality, especially if they believe you hold the eyes that see the future. Mika returns home to find herself in a paradox. Greeting her at the door is herself, yet also not. Mika and Mika lock eyes, but there is something off about the one that was already present in the home. It's as if she lacks a soul, a thinking, feeling, governing structure that is in each human being. She feels hollow, her eyes like a void. Mika seems to have been picked and placed upon a deferring space-time, and being that only one Mika exists, God or the Creator making all individual souls different and unique, two bodies cannot exist at one given time and hold the soul that makes Mika more than just an instinctual vessel. The Mika that does not belong at this space and time, the one currently housing the soul evaporates in front of us, her soul hovering where she once stood. Why Mika's essence didn't attach itself to the body in front of her is a mystery, but one that probably has something to do with the nights and the fact that her sanity had crumbled. In that moment when locking eyes with herself, Mika lost sight of who she was, and so Mika lost her form, her soul left wandering. Lane walks in to see her sister's vessel staring towards the door. When asked what's wrong, Mika's body simply responds nothing, leaving the hallway. Lane watches as her sister's essence disappears from their plane of existence. A central point made by serial experiments is that we exist in the mind of others. To be real, we need to be acknowledged. Otherwise, we're no more than an aberration, something that will be explored a little more later. But the question is, what does that have to do with kids? What is the beginning quote trying to tell us? While the two concepts here don't bear many ties, children are the youth of society, our futures that will take over when we get old. If we pass the idea of ourselves, i.e. telling stories, interacting with the young, our lives will continue after our death within the minds of the living. That's one way we can walk with that, but this layer seems to focus on another. Over a few different segments, we see children offering up themselves to the skies, arms open as if looking to something divine. The first time we encounter this, Lane along with us have no idea what the child looks to. All we know is that within a flash, the boy is gone. Alice and company take Lane out, Alice being worried that Lane is reverting, she's no longer as outgoing nor sociable, once more quiet and timid, almost like the transcendence of the wired was a farce, that belief that this was her heaven, her nirvana, was temporary, a sign that her concepts of it are not entirely correct. At the shopping mall with her friends, Lane wears more mature clothes, yet they're a polarizing look for her. Like a wolf in sheep's clothing, Lane, specifically this personality of Lane, is just a kid. While the others get by looking older, we know that in the end they are just kids, no matter how much they try not to be. Out of the crowd, two children are spotted once more assuming the same stance as the child Lane saw in passing. This time, however, the sky is not empty. Confusion strikes the crowd of people, that is except the children. They welcome this being. Alice looks to Lane to see her frozen in surprise. This is not her doing. Only the knights could accomplish such a feat as this. Lane looks back to the sky, but Lane of the Wired has disappeared, the children with it. 
Wiping away her mask, Lane assumes her other persona, entering the Navi in full form. She seeks a man, Professor Hodgson. Like Lane, Hodgson has achieved the same ability to translate himself into the wire, leaving his body idle in reality. You may be thinking this as well, and it couldn't be an accident that Hodgkin eerily resembles Sigmund Freud, the famous psychologist we've already pulled a few theories on personality from. Lane pushes him to tell her about kids, also known as the Kensington Experiment. Hodgkin believed that children held an innate ability called parapsychological, PSI, a sort of psychic abilities we see often in movies and anime. It turned out that Hodgkin was indeed onto something, but really the level of PSI was not all that powerful. Maybe enough to see the future, to see prophecy, or just maybe bend a coin. But what if he combined the ability of several children. Out of this hypothesis, the kid's system was born. Hodgkin took a few dozen children into this experiment, hooking them up to a string of wires connected by a giant vat that sat in the center, collecting their PSI. He didn't account, though, for how powerful the raw PSI would be, and the kid's system could not maintain form. The raw power went supernova. All test subjects were lost. The kid's system had claimed the life of dozens. Hodgkins couldn't bring himself to destroy his experimental data or the schematics for the child-killing bomb of a system. These eventually leaked online to be taken by the Knights. They had recreated the system to function through the wired. No longer needed was a suited-up kid system. The wire acted as the core, collecting the children's PSI ability. But it's unclear what happens to the children after. They seemingly disappear from space-time, and we know the Knights are not against killing if for the purpose of their holy mission. The question remains, though, what do they need this power for? Not even Lane knows the answer. All she can do is echo her frustrations through the wire. Hodgkin dies, passing on to the next plane of existence. It seems even projecting your being into the wire cannot save you from the death of our vessels. Lane rejoins reality, alone in front of her navy. The red dots reappear. They've returned, standing once more out the window, watching. Lane walks down to confront the pair, interrogating them on their motives, the knight's purpose. She's met with silence until... <laughs> The coolant in Lane's system has failed, probably a parasite bomb planted from within the wired. The MIB make it clear to her they do not work for the Knights. A society begins with just two people. At that point, there is the birth of the first social rules, things we agree upon so that we don't kill each other. Society exists in any group of people, take for instance family or fan base, each a different society that has its own unique constructs. And then there's Lane, a being with seemingly no connections. At least that seems what they want you to think when we open into this layer. Polarizing to her state is the Knights, the secret society who is pulling the strings. And a strange man wandering Tokyo in a tricked out mobile navi, an executive checking his emails, an overweight shut-in, a stay-at-home mother. What do all these individuals have in common? They are bound together by the society that is the Knights. Their differences put aside for the sake of their shared religious society, their shared belief that tearing down the barrier between will offer them transcendence. Parallel to the Knights, however, is Tachibana Laboratory. We learn that they are the ones who employed the MIB, who escort Lane with her permission to meet the man in grey, who seems to be heading this operation. At first, he's unsure whether Lane is a knight. Despite her best efforts, she is the major key for the knight's goal, and the Lane of the Wired has been assisting them. Like previously stated, this Wired Lane operates on her own will, a part of Lane that wasn't transferred to her bodily form. Think of it like the story of Jesus and God being one and the same. It wasn't that God existed entirely in Jesus, but Jesus existed as God. God all the same. Lane is the same way. The Wired is where she came from. Even while present in Tachibana Labs, there is a her still within the Wired. A man in grey comes to understand this, but neither Lane's timid persona nor her assertive one seems to grasp this. The man in grey also explains to her the truth behind her family. Lane is unable to answer any common questions about her parents, causing her to break down and shift the trauma of knowing the truth to her more strong-willed persona. This one accepts the possible truth in the man in grey's information. She goes to leave, but not before the man tells her one last thing. She is the root cause of the crumbling barrier between Wired and reality, something they find incredibly dangerous. Lane, on the other hand, simply thinks it's interesting. She leaves, the man in grey telling the MIBs to let her go, that they should sit on the sidelines and watch as whatever is to come begins. As Lane said, 
it should be interesting. We can sit here and question the true motives of the gray-suited man, but ultimately there is no way of knowing. It's obvious, despite believing the danger in the merging of the two worlds, he is not all that interested in preventing it. It seems for his own reasons, he wants Lane to continue down this road. That, like everyone around Lane, this conversation was just his way of influencing her. As different as Tachibana tries to seem, they're no different than the Knights. A society trying to influence the kid who will become God. <laughs> Rumors. Something shared with the possibility of being true spread with the desire that it is. No one spreads rumors they want to not be true. They're spread in hopes that they are, or at least become. People crave knowledge, especially that which is hurtful. The more detrimental the information can be to someone's life, the more powerful knowing it becomes. Lane has heard a rumor that her parents are fake, and this rumor turns out to be true. Inversely tied to this, a rumor about Alice circulates, which also turns out to be true. Alice has a crush on their male teacher, something that no one should know about her, but all of mankind is connected to the wire, some not realizing how much it knows about their personal life. And there is one who is all-knowing in that world. At the moment of revelation, when Lane's parents were confirmed to be fakes, it's very possible Lane's personality split even further. Actions happening around Lane that it would seem Lane did, but we as viewers, along with Lane herself, knows she didn't. Or so we thought. Within the Wired, not only is the omnipotent, invisible presence that is Lane of the Wired residing, but a new, unflattering Lane has appeared. The one who catches Alice masturbating to her teacher. The one who craves to spread and obtain these kind of rumors. Lane's ID. Bringing back up Freud's iceberg theory of the mind, that at the unconscious level our mind is made up of three parts. On one half, the superego, the moralistic ideals we are all born with, that sense of justice we all feel feel. These come from an unknown source, likely God or some type of creator of our beings. On the other half of the unconscious iceberg is ego, which takes up the top half. This is who we project ourselves as to society, to our friends and family. It's that part of you that makes you different, and it's also the side of you that answers to your ID and carries out its desires. ID is a concept Freud theorized as the root of the self present at the beginning of birth. While your ego is absent as you haven't constructed it yet, and your superego is taking shape, the ID is the instinctual component that carries the needs and wants of you. Our aggression, our emotional impulses and desires. Our ego communicates to our conscious self these desires for the sake of the ID. The ID is our selfishness incarnate. In Lane's case, her ID has escaped from beneath the iceberg, and what greater desire to fulfill than collecting knowledge, rumors, on her best friend. The ID simply seeks enjoyment, amusement. Without the balancing of the superego, it does not care who gets hurt by their decisions. Lane is forced to confront her inner desires that she has denied the existence of. During her usual scroll through conversations occurring on the wire, she becomes irritable, stating the pointlessness of it all. A voice points out to her, though, the true emotion she feels. <laughs> His voice seems to crown itself with godhood, but only slightly. It admits it's not the creator of the world, nor the all-powerful ruler. But if the definition of god is one who exists everywhere in that other world, then it supposes it could be called that. Lane seems confused a little, having not caught on that who it's talking about is none other than herself. The voice makes this clear. <laughs> Lane doesn't agree with the voice, but it points out. <laughs> Her phone reads to her this phrase, Peeping Tom. Looking up, she realizes that all eyes are on her. Running to the hallway, the result is the same. The role has been switched. Lane has been listening and watching everyone through the wired in moments of privacy. But now, she is being shown the uncomfortable nature of her actions. This confrontation of her issues is too much for the timid Lane. And almost as if to symbolize like a phoenix she is born anew, Lane erupts into a great flame. Walking out different. Her two personalities, the assertive and timid, have died, and from the ashes rose something new. Lane's body is slumped on her bed. In the wired, she confronts her ID, the her that leaked Alice's secrets. <laughs> She attempts to strangle her, confused and afraid, acknowledging the body heat she feels from Lane. She denies the person in front of her the title of Lane. She wouldn't do what this one did. 
right? The voice reappears, telling Lane it is as much a god as she is. The two of them are both omnipresent in the wired. She has always existed here and always will. It explains that there is a Lane inside of every beam, just as there is a her inside the construct known as the wired. <laughs> In turn, that means she has seen everything and told everyone everything she's seen. She's unsure what to do with this testimony. She's forced to grasp with the concept of being a god. How do you accept that? She states that her friend saw her in the wired when she wasn't there. Therefore, it wasn't her. God is lying to Lane and she attempts to test him. If she really is what it says she is, then she could delete Lane from their memories, wipe Lane's existence. God nods along with her reasoning, telling her to give it a try, and she does. The next day, Lane goes to school, her wishes come true. Everyone has forgotten about Lane, but if Lane doesn't exist, if she deleted herself, then that means she no longer exists. She cannot be acknowledged. A version of Lane emerges from her to make clear to Lane that this isn't her anymore. If you delete yourself, you cannot participate in the reality she holds so dear. You have no one to acknowledge your presence or lack thereof. The Lane speaks to her. Lane wa Lane. Atashi wa atashi. That's so, this Lane disappears, as if she's been erased from mankind's memories. Lane comes to reality in front of her Navi. She attempts to find solace with her machine, asking it who Lane is, what Lane is. Lane is herself, no one else is Lane, right? It seems the rumors may be true. It may be that Lane is not just Lane. <laughs> There is a protocol to Lane in its layers. It shares information with us on a need-to-know basis, not before. It focuses on showing us, not telling, following from the point of view of the protagonist. But this layer is different. Despite being called protocol, layer 9 is anything but that. Merging info dumps with story progression, a foreign episode structure. The first info dump is on the infamous Roswell, New Mexico UFO landing, a prime example of rumor being adopted as fact, as history. Many to this day believe that an alien UFO landed in July of 19. The second conspiracy known as the MJ-12 document was allegedly leaked by the FBI in 1984, a peace treaty with aliens signed by the president and other well-known officials and scientists. The third is about a man named Bush from 1945 who first thought up the idea of compressing information, the whole idea around computers. Fourth, John C. Lilly, who used humans in unethical experiments, also inventing sensory deprivation tanks, and a big believer in the ECCO, a conspiracy that higher entities control us. ECCO is the lowest office on the string of this command chain. It's worth noting his research involved a lot of psychoactive drugs, which he did take part in. Fifth, Ted Nelson, who thought up the idea of storing the world's information in a digital database, his idea being a satellite which holds information readily available to project down to anywhere in the world where the a terminal. Sixth, the concept Schumann resonance. Some call it Earth's brainwaves, a fancy way of talking about Earth's projected frequency put off by the electromagnetic field that protects life on Earth. And with this, we are also told an interesting theory, a theory that if all humans were connected, we may awaken Earth's consciousness, that of the entity we live on. So what was the point of breaking the protocol of the story and telling us this? Was it to make a point or to make us aware of some of the possibilities behind mankind's creation of the wire? The talk of aliens that's parallel to the scientific concepts that led to the creation of the internet, along with the blend of the two and John C. Lilly, a scientist who believed in a secret cosmic society. All of these are historical people, real events that serial experiments is using to test us. Do you believe in the Roswell UFO landing? What about MJ-12? If yes, you may think that aliens created the Wired. Do you believe the database of information and compacting it is a human feat? You likely believe we created the internet. But the test from here is the Schumann resonance in John C. Lilly. These two blend between logic and curiosity. What if you accept both the alien and scientifical. You may wonder if something like the ECCO exists that Lily thought up, or if the Schumann resonance would really awaken the earth if all humans connected. There is a man that believes in all these ideas and people, a man that is the reason we are privy to this information, the man who pretends he is God, Eddie. Lane scours the Wired once again, during which a lot of conversations are thrown out, each with varying levels of importance, some even prophesizing future events. The one in specific I want to focus on is murmurs of a little man in a striped shirt who allegedly visits people at night. It seems that Lane is now living this enigma. The little man watches her from her door, disappearing as quick as it appears. We don't know how real he was, or if he was just a symbol of Lane's alienation from others. But that is left, like the Roswell incident, 
up to our interpretation. It could have happened as much as it didn't, the protocol of information dumps seeming to try to lead us to think a certain way. Lane bickers with unknown individuals. She fights them on her omnipresence within the wire, denying it, afraid of it. Yet they push her towards the truth. At Siberia, Lane confronts Tato. She was left a microchip by him that, if installed, would have wiped her machine's memory and hers along with it. She gets him to confess he is working for the Knights. She also makes clear to him the state of her existence. The wild Lane and timid Lane are one and the same now. Her personalities have converged. She is now one, the Phoenix Reborn. She has come to terms with the fact that, while there is no other her in the real world, in the Wired, there is a possibility of more than one of her existing. Lane does a memory check, exposing an earlier memory we have not seen up to this point. It seems that coming to terms with everything has revealed what she originally denied, the men in black suits delivering her to her family. She asks that past self if she is Lane. She responds that yes, she is. Lane asks her who they are, the people she was brought to. She doesn't know. She's her after all. Lane cannot know what Lane doesn't know. Lane believes it to be a lie, all of it, and denies the memory. <laughs> Eri appears. The seventh, final info dump I left for the end. Eri Masami, chief researcher of Tachibana General Labs, believer in the hypothesis of a worldwide neural network, and expanded on it, adding its concept to what is the wired. The world neural network was a thought that the billions of messages and information we send over the internet connects us, linking the minds of humanity into one global brain. Eddie used this theory as a base structure, encoded in the Schumann resonance, in the seventh gen Navi chips on his own initiative, hoping to link all people on an unconscious scale. As as disclosed earlier, this resulted in Tachibana dismissing Eri for defiance, and one week later his body would be found abandoned. Eri had supposedly become God, and God has finally made his appearance. How does one define love? I myself struggle to ever put it into words. Despite the love I may feel, there is just that feeling that no words could do it justice, which seems precisely how serial experiment sees it. There is no quote, no monologue that could summarize this layer's concept. Not even the entirety of the episode could hope to. Instead, love inhabits the show just as it does in reality, in strange, odd ways, beginning with a connection between a false god and a deity. Lane argues that she caused the protocol, the disruption of the barrier between wired and reality, to occur. She's able to read human memories from within the wired, be all-knowing, omnipresent. She counters by pointing out without people to worship her, she is no god. Eddie points out that she made this, yet abandoned them, that being the Knights, a product of the Lane of the Wired. God attempts to call back Lane to the Wired, but she desires to remain in reality. So God disappears, for now. Lane appears in class, but her desk is gone. Her existence erased from her classmates' heads, as we know from Layer 8. With no one to observe her existence, it's as if she's not there. Lane asserts to herself that she is real, alive, present. She's afraid of being forgotten by the ones she loves, by her friends. She spirals, believing that this is her fault, and in many ways it is. Alice, in a vision, sits up behind her, asserting to Lane that she is not needed in the real world, confirming Lane's fears. Lane's house is barren, her parents nowhere to be found. She walks through the empty bedrooms, picking up her sister's room, when her father suddenly appears in the doorway. One definition of love is something you find worthwhile to say goodbye to. Despite the pain in leaving someone, you find worth in burdening it, to show the other you truly care, and to hear the words back, to know that they truly care. What love Lane's father felt will only ever be known by him, but we can tell, at the very least, that love was felt, that love was there. That's all we need to know.
Lane's desire for connection with others is sat in front of her, but she fears it. Connection is only part of love, the other is being with them. If Lane connects, she will only gain half the love she seeks out, but there is an alternative. What if she brought the wire to reality, the place she loves, brought to the place with the people she loves? Lane's connection to the wired has transcended possibilities. She has completed her task in a way. She has brought the wire directly to reality, combined the two worlds. In the middle of Shibuya, she stands connected. Yet there is a deity that wished her to bring reality to the wired, not the other way. To protect her will, she must strip him of his godship, and to do so, she must rid the world of his believers, his worshippers, the followers of knights. The wire does not deny her their identities. The MIB hunt down the members one by one, their deaths logged as suicides. Lane sits on her floor, coated in wires, her body limp and lifeless. The men in black enter her room, having completed their will. Lane asks why they did it. Why kill the believers of the knights? You can't be allowed to exist in the wired either, but yet here you are. They tell Lane their client, Tachibana Labs, is attempting to rewrite the Protocol 7 code that will combine the two worlds completely. They move to leave, but the tall one stops, but for a moment. He takes off his headgear, revealing his eyes, an act of vulnerability. They say God is one you cannot help but love, and if this is true, before it sits it in the body of an estranged girl, love truly is odd. Lane asks Eddie what he will do now. She has robbed him of his worshippers, the knights. He can no longer be called God. But Eli asserts he hasn't lost all his worshippers yet. As long as one believer in him remains, he can still be God. There is still Lane. <laughs> Lane denies this. She wants to rid him of his godship, but she can't help but feel he is one. She once more denies him. Again, she denies. Lane struggles with the belief that Eddie is her creator, fighting the belief in his omnipresence, hoping to come to the realization he is a leech. All she needs to realize is his power comes from the her that exists in the wired. But just as the MIB loved her despite the lack of reason, Lane cannot help but love in some twisted fashion the man who created her. She asks him about the other her, the one within the wired. God simply tells her that isn't another her, it is her. But this allows Lane a path out of the obligated love she feels for her creator. This man did not in fact create her, he only created her body. Her fight for power over the false god begins here. She denies Eddie of his power with the simple words, echoing like a challenge to his control. Eddie is propelled back. Power lines collapse around her, laying questions what is true. How many times has she been lied to? Am I me? Lane is all present through time. Lane abandons her human form of memory, adopting one of computing power, downloading her memories from the wired in a more logical and less emotion-based sense. Her mind, her memory now emulating that of a computer, of her navi. The layer's title, Infornography, a play on the words information and pornography, which capture the state of desire Lane seeks, a desire for information logical and untampered by human emotions. God appears. He acknowledges Lane's ability, speaking of her as if she was a machine, which angers her. He corrects himself, calling her software, one that was given a body. He once more disappears. 
Lane is confronted by a tipping scale. Chisa and the man who shot himself at Siberia appearing before her. Their existence called forth by Lane as the angel and devil that sit upon her shoulders. They represent her polarizing beliefs of death. Chisa tells Lane there is nothing easy about dying, while the man says it is. Will she choose to die and reside in the wired like the god wants from her, or will she choose to fulfill her own desire and stay in reality? The world becomes an urban sprawl of flesh. Peeking through her door, Lane, with the body of the little striped shirt alien man, a symbol of the alienation between her and Alice. She no longer recognizes who Lane has become, even while being the only one who has been able to hold on to her memories of Lane. The alien Lane denies spreading the rumor, telling Alice that there exist various Lanes. But not to worry, she will set things right. She will erase the rumor that has plagued their school, and that very next day her claim comes true. Lane no longer doesn't exist, but the rumor alone remains erased, erased from the heads of everyone except Lane and Alice. It seems that's not all Lane has done. The girls converge around Lane like they're the best of friends. It may be that she used her connection to all mankind in the Wired to force all to love her. The only one that seems to not have been tampered with is Alice. Why? Alice does not know, but as she looks at her friend, watches her smile towards her, the same unsavory smile she made on her bed when she originally told her she leaked the rumor. Alice and we realize this Lane is not the one we've come to know. This Lane resembles her ID, her original self and all its selfish desires. She may have righted wrongs, but she did so in a heavily amoralistic way. She has obtained control over all mankind and bends it around her finger. Free will does not exist when all are tied to the same string. So the world and the people that populate it can be seen as landscape for one's own existence. This is taking the definition of landscape into a hypothetical zone that only Socrates would be proud to hear, but it's exactly what this layer wants us to do. The characters around Lane that have been the background of the story so far take center stage. Lane believes that these people, along with every other person in reality, was the cause of the multi-Lane issue. She was thought to be so many things by others, resulting in splits of her. Lane's that acted how Lane was thought to be, but after connecting all, Lane has centralized the collective into thinking of Lane in one way, that being her ID the one speaking to Alice, but that is not our lane. The two men in black reflect on their actions, how their orders failed to prevent the wired and reality merging, almost like that was never their true goal. They suspect that Eri was behind it all, their client, the man in gray, had misled them. He too was working for Eri, the false god. Another sedan rolls up, their payment thrown onto the ground in front of them. They ask the man in gray why he did this, his response simply. <laughs> As the man leaves, the ponytailed MIB begins freaking out as if a ghost has appeared before him. He's brutally attacked by this invisible entity, the last thing reflected in his eyes an image of Lane. The tall one attempts to scan the area for the entity, but is unable to trace it as it closes in on him. He, too, is murdered by the apparition. We do not know what has happened to them, but it could be that there is a Lane that has not yet been accepted into the collective. The place is in ruins, a heavy fog masking the downstairs. At the top of the steps, the soulless body of Mika is perched, mimicking modem sounds as if trying to reconnect to something, possibly her own soul. Alice walks past, afraid, but she's already made the decision to confront Lane. She pushes forward. In her room, the true Lane lays, drowned in a pile of wires. Alice pulls her out and begs to know why. Why did Lane leave only her memories alone? Why did she bestow the burden of memory upon her? Was it out of hate? Spite? Lane's taken aback by this. She had done so out of a desire not to hurt Alice, to show Alice the love she has for her. Alice was the only person that loved Lane without being connected to her through the wire. She had been driven to connecting all unconsciously in a selfish desire to be loved. While no one may know they are being pulled by strings, since as humans we are not aware of the deepest of our unconscious self, it nonetheless affects us in ways we can only imagine. Alice doesn't understand what Lane means. She does not know what we know, doesn't understand Lane and her abilities, her reason for creation. The only ones that understand Lane's burden are herself, me, and you. Matamata, 
It doesn't matter anymore which side was real to begin with. The wired her here. She was in both. She was a program created to eliminate the barrier in between. But this thought is just Lane in denial. Lane just wants to be human like everyone else, a normal being. She wants to feel the normalcy. So she brought her true self that was in the wire to reality, merged them so that she could say she really exists here. She isn't just some entity on the web, some program created by a mere man. She is the being known as Lane. She tells Alice that everyone, including her, are just applications like she is. Lane's concept of souls. Everyone doesn't need bodies. Alice doesn't follow. All she knows is she disagrees. She tells Lane that she feels cold, but despite that, she is very much alive, just as Alice is in front of her, telling her to feel her heartbeat, trying to show her that they are not machines, they are living. Alice tells Lane she is afraid, and Lane is curious as to why, but God interjects. <laughs> God tells Lane to block Alice's negative pathways, to connect with her like all others, but Lane is not sure that is the right answer. Alice cannot see God as Lane does, only Lane muttering to herself. This is a pivotal moment in serial experiments where we realize that this God we assumed could take form in reality, just as Lane can take form in the wired, is not as omnipotent as he made himself seem. We can once more question the validity of this man's godship and so can Lane. Eddie states that he will debug Lane, fix her into the perfect program to execute his will, an apparition like hand visible reaching towards Lane, but she denies God's hand. What Eddie did was remove devices from the wire, the very tools that allowed him to become what he is currently, a conscious without body, residing in the wired. Eddie counters that humans who have evolved further than others have a right to these greater abilities, but Lane points at his fallacy. God shudders. Lane goes on. <laughs> He realizes what she's implying, that his idea was not his own, that something or someone assisted him in obtaining the information of his predecessors to reaching this new advancement. That being, the type that can influence through prophecy, had reached him. There really is a god, and it's not Eddie. He becomes angry, confused by this revelation. Lane tells him without flesh he won't understand the concept that is god anyway. He takes Lane's words as a challenge. He is the one who gave her a body. He is omnipotent. Lane may have been omnipresent, scattered through the wired, but he was the one who gave her an ego, gave her the form known as Lane. Lane points out his contradiction. Then who made the ego that is Eddie? Who made his original body? He attempts to form his own body as proof of his godhood, that no real god could outmatch him, exposing Eddie's weakness. Eddie's amalgamation of flesh tries to attack Lane. God has come out of the wired in an unholy form. He who believes in his own divineness is really only blinded by his own ego. Lane pushes him further. Eddie attempts to bring more flesh into form, mistakenly missing the realization that the moment this body he is now houses his soul and dies, he will no longer be able to participate in this plane of existence. The computers around him are pulled along with the flesh-like substance, crushing his hellish form, and the room grows quiet. Where is the real lane? Or is there no lane? The ego of a being only exists inside the people who are aware of your existence. And since your ego is who your name is, what you've done in the world you interact with, Lane is stumped on what she really is after you take that all away. What is the original source of her being? Almost as if answering Lane's posed question, Ego is the name of this final layer, but at the same time it fails to answer the posed question. Lane may be talking through her ego, but the source of her reflection, the being that initially thought, is deeper than the iceberg theory goes. Behind the Freudian theory of ego, superego, and ID is blank. The iceberg stops, but the question arises what comes after the iceberg, or to phrase it better, what comes before. 
Are we more than what we can even comprehend? For Lane, that may be true. Realizing the pain she put Alice through, the suffering she has created existing in this reality, Lane questions whether her existence is morally valid. What does she offer to this world? What ties her here? The answer is the people. She has grown to love humanity, a love beyond comprehension. But for the ones she loves to be happy, Lane cannot be Lane. The ego known as Lane must be erased. Freud believed that the ego doesn't just communicate with our conscious self, but also with the superego. In an eternal debate between selflessness and selfishness, the two sides of us try to find common ground when making decisions, but sometimes one wins over the other. Lane's decision to erase herself, a prime example. The ego exists to keep us alive, protect and serve our original self by any means, which is why it can be so self-centered at times. But the ego can lose out. Lane's suicide was the morally right answer to save all mankind, and her ego recognized it as the path forward. Despite this meaning the death of the ego, it could not compete against the righteous path Lane chose, burdening the sins of humanity, pressing into death and lost memories for the betterment of mankind. Lane was a martyr that no one would remember. Lane is no more. The world has been reset to a slightly alternative timeline. Eddie works at Tachibana Labs once more, but we are assured that he will not be getting any ideas of becoming a god. The MIB work as linemen. Alice has forgotten her trauma. Lane's family is whole once more. The only missing piece is Lane herself. Some that were closer to Lane, her father, Alice, can feel the missing presence that was Lane. But alas, they have no way to recall her. It may just be that deep in their psyche, below the ego, lies a remembrance of her. What isn't remembered never happened. Memory is like a record, you just need to rewrite that record. It's not as if their being doesn't still recognize the absence of another, the one known as Lane. But the ability to recall the ego that was Lane is gone. Lane is not remembered interacting with this world, so her ego never existed. Only the true essence of Lane still exists. Present day. Present time. <laughs> Lane cries in the heavy fog of a barren town, only to be confronted by herself. This is where things get a little ambiguous. Our Lane represents the essence that is Lane, the one who chose to abandon her ego, who chose to erase herself. She is the whole iceberg, and what lies beneath. Before her is the original self, her ID. She realizes that despite not knowing what she is below the Freudian iceberg, she is not the god her ID thinks they are. She is omnipresent within all mankind, but that is not all God is. It seems we will never know, but Her idea attempts to persuade Lane to start everything over from the beginning, to relive the story of serial experiments Lane, to remain alive. Her original self is desperate to remain a part of reality. It's her deepest desire, after all, to be a normal human being, but she denies herself of this. She abandons the ID, the ego. Her ID freezes. Our Lane has chosen her fate. She has sided with her moral compass and abandoned the desires she holds. It vanishes, no longer a part of the being that was Lane. So, Lane. Before Lane moves on to whatever may lie next for her, she is summoned out of the dark by her super ego in the form of her father. Here she tells it of her love for everyone else, what drove her to this point. It understands. After all, it's the part of her who longed for Lane to make this decision. She cries. <laughs> An interesting theory, the idea that time is not linear but simultaneous. Memory of this time part of both ourselves, our interaction with our ego, but also the collective unconscious, that which the wire may have been channeled through. Alice and Lane reunite, something in Alice recognizes Lane, shown through her suspicion that she may have met this little girl. But those memories of the girl she grew up with, known as Lane, are no longer available for her to recall. She just has that feeling as if she has met her before. They depart with a goodbye, Alice hoping they can meet again. Lane says they can meet any time. It could be that Lane is still quietly observing humanity from the sidelines, or maybe she has been reincarnated as a normal being, or maybe the story of serial experiments is bound to repeat itself. Whichever it may be, we are just left to ponder our own thoughts. 
as the hum of electric poles bid us a farewell. We tackled a lot. Lane tackled a lot. We were forced to bear witness to the uncertainty of mankind, of its future given the rise of this new strange creation that is the internet. We construct a virtual world that becomes more diverse and real by the day, all while still lacking full comprehension of ourselves. Serial Experiments makes a point of that, each layer adding to the next, introducing a new theme each time, a new concept to reflect upon as you get deeper. Weird. Girls. Psyche. Religion. Distortion. Kids. Society. Rumors. Protocol, love, infornography, landscape, ego. The meaning of these titles are much deeper than just one word, but we've already explored those enough for today. Together they throw countless of questions at us, more than we have answers to. Blending together in various ways, their meanings change when you account for new factors. It's impossible to solve them all. It's impossible to understand all of serial experiments. Such is the irony of the name. Serial and computing may mean running only a single task, but the series is opposed to doing so. We are forced to reflect on all these topics through each layer, to look back, to look forward, to look directly in front of us. This show is anything but serial, and that's the beauty of this anime. You and I will focus on different pieces of the show, find different meanings in the same events, and that's okay. For 25 years, the Lane fanbase has done this, has debated the true ending or true meaning of it all, but there isn't one. Strange for me to say, given this video is supposed to make sense of it all, yet this show was created as a collection of ideas, of theories of possibilities. It took the new and terrifying concept of the 90s that was the internet and used it as a background for a show that took a deep and uncomfortable look at what we are as humans and predicted many of the problems we as humans would face. As the internet got bigger, the information got more complex, the operations became more unique. Nowadays, it reaches out to comfort and share with you in countless ways. Somehow, some way, you were chosen to watch this video. An algorithm that operates on its own thought process we as humans constructed decided that you needed to see this video. Maybe it's trying to tell you something, or better yet, maybe something beyond our comprehension is using that very algorithm to tell you something. Maybe it was fate that brought you here, fate that caused me to create and post this analysis. Who knows? What I do know is that you and I are now connected. You have heard my voice, have had a look into how I think, and I, I'll be privy to seeing your response to me. Through your comments, your likes, how long you watch this video, through that I get to connect with you. And so we are connected. The web, the wired, has connected us all. It's just not as fanatical as we saw for Lane. But hey, maybe she's out there, an entity like Lane, watching over us. Maybe our future doesn't look that much different than her present day. Thank <laughs> you.